So the Battle of Ice and Fire, also known as the Battle of Winterfell. So this is basically the end of Game of Thrones, the main plotline at least. I mean, Cersei's still on the Iron Throne, you still have the temporal things to sort out, but the apocalypse is adverted, the dawn has come, the, the whole Others White Walker plot has been completely resolved. And given the fact that this has gone on for eight seasons and two episodes this season, uh, you if you remember, I was complaining about episode one and two because nothing happened and it was just build up to this episode. Realistically, I don't know if there was any way, I mean, or I guess some people would say, I don't know if there was any way that this could live up to expectations. But people also said that about the Battle of the Wall and that exceeded people's expectations. And like the... The fight between the mountain and the viper, that exceeded people's expectations. You had the Battle of the Bastards, which exceeded people's expectations. So it's not as if these things don't pay off with these, these big buildups. And I think there's a difference between something not quite reaching the height it could have and being an unmitigated disaster. You can say, oh, I think it could have been a bit better, but it was still pretty good versus no that that was that didn't make any sense that was horrible so like i said when i watched this I, I i didn't like it i really didn't like it it wasn't as bad as the first two episodes of this season just because more happened but at the same time i was just kind of like something's wrong with this something is missing i mean the first and most obvious thing and i complained about this in my other review but this has the worst cinematography of probably any TV show I've ever seen. Like when I used to download things bat off of Kazaa, back when I was eight years old and I used to download the like 260p things, that looked better than this. That somehow looked better than this. Like it was so dark, it was blurry. The camera was just shaking. It kept cutting and cutting and cutting. Like I couldn't tell what was going on. I couldn't tell who died. Like, I thought one of the dragons died. I thought, like, Sam died. I thought, like, all these other characters died, but it was just bad camera work. So that's, like, a big problem. If, if you're going to have the big climatic battle and no one can tell, like, what's even going on, that's not really a good sign. That That's really not a good sign. So what was wrong with this battle? Why do I think it failed? Why Why did I dislike it so much? Well, I think to see why it, it was bad, I, I think we have to compare it to what are generally considered some of the best hopeless battles in in movie uh, movie history. Battles in which the good guys, are you know they're probably going to lose eventually, but it's still really exciting and really just engaging. So obviously the most, um, probably one that comes to mind first is the Battle of Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. We have the Battle of Endor in Return of the Jedi. We also have the final battle in Zulu, although they actually win that one. And I guess kind of another example is the Battle of Reach in the Halo series. So these are all what I would consider to be good examples of a last stand. So why do I think these examples are good, but this one completely fails as a last stand? Okay, in all the, the examples I previously mentioned, the good guys basically do everything they possibly can to win the battle. They, they haven't just resigned themselves to winning through deus ex machina. Even if a deus ex machina is involved, like in the Battle of Endor, they're going to blow the Death Star up. Even if that's there, the good guys still try to win using all available methods. And because they're trying, and because they do everything possible to try to win, even if it looks like they're not, generally speaking, the battles are very close. Like, let's take the Battle of Helm's Deep, for instance. They, they made all the right calls. They armed everybody they possibly could. They had their archers positioned. They withdrew within their walls. They, they fortified them. They, they were in a really good defensive position and they had their troops set up properly and they fought really, really well. And it actually looked for a while that they were going to win until they came in with the bomb. But the thing is that was intense because even if you technically knew how the battle was gonna turn out, 
because you saw the foreshadowing with Gandalf going away or you've read the books or someone spoiled it for you or, or something like that, it was still very tense because you didn't know what was going to happen. And it looked very much so like they were going to somehow win. They were going to somehow pull it out because they had a plan and, and there was a tension from the fact that the heroes had a plan and they were doing much better than they had any right to. Let's take the Battle of Endor. Now, the rebel forces were just supposed to be a distraction. They weren't supposed to, to win the battle, but they did everything they possibly could to win. I always really liked that moment when Lando goes, we're going to just charge the Star Destroyers because then they can't use the Death Star and we might be able to take out a couple of them. And I mean, that is that is a sound military decision. Honestly, it probably would have been a better idea to get really close to the Death Star, but... That at least made sense, and he's trying to win the battle. Even though they can't win it by conventional means, they can still help the overall war out if they can take down a bunch of ships. They're thinking in, in kind of general strategic terms, and they do manage to get some successes. They manage to take down the Executor. They blow up a bunch of other Star Destroyers. The battle keeps shifting. Like, when the Executor gets shot down, then... Um, Things just, like I said, they keep shifting throughout it. During Helm's Deep, sometimes the heroes are on top, sometimes the Orakai are on top. Same thing. Um, Battle of Reach is also like that. You know that Reach is going to fall, but it's such a like an epic fight. Like the, um, the humans have just built so many defense platforms. You have Master Chief and the Spartans. You have the ODST. They lose but they just lose in such a way, inflicting such horrific losses on the Covenant. And it's just very exciting. Um, I guess kind of the other one is the the Zulu attack um, and the, the final battle in Zulu. And, and what's good about that is you have two competent sides fighting one another. The Zulus in that movie are shown to be very disciplined and very well organized and, and they use proper tactics and strategy. And the British also have uh, discipline and organization. So even if you know how the battle turns out, both sides know what they're doing and there's tension because the Zulus sometimes break through, the British sometimes are able to, to beat them back. There's a lot of tension and, and that's what makes these things good. That's what makes them epic. That's what makes them nail biters. Because like with, with Helm's Deep, like I said, up until the end, you're not really, even if you know how it's going to end, you're watching it and you just don't know like uh, how many people are going to die, what's going to happen, etc. And in this case, they lose in the first 10 minutes of the episode. There's, there's no realistic chance of them actually winning. Like they even say at the beginning, we're not going to be able to win this. We just have to kill the Night King. And I'm like, are you, are you guys like even going to try to win this as a straight out battle? Like, and they're like, no, not really. We're going to just half ass it. And I'm like, you guys have a reasonable chance of winning and we're going to go down. And this is why this battle sucks. Okay. So let's look at this. So, the, okay. So we have the two sides. We have the army of the living and the army of the dead. So let's see what the cat that the the force totals are. Okay, so the Starks have infantry and archers. So I guess the remainder of the Northern Bannermen. Let's say maybe that's three thousand people, or or something like that. You have eight thousand unsullied heavy infantry. Once again, very very well trained, well equipped. A hundred thousand Dothraki light cavalry. A hundred thousand. Two dragons, 2,000 Knights of the Veil seems really low. I get it that the Veil isn't particularly well um, widely populated as some of the other regions, but you think they could maybe spare like five to 10,000 guys. And, and those are knights. Um, they're, it, well, they're dismounted, so they're dismounted knights. Historically, in some battles, if you look at some of the battles in the Crusades, dismounted knights and crossbowmen will beat Muslim forces like 10 times their size. It's almost impossible to kill someone in full plate with normal weapons. Basically, you either have to wait till they get tired or you just have to dogpile them and slip a dagger in through their visor. I mean, this is an issue I had with this episode. And once again, it's, it's like I get it that it's fiction. I get it that it's fantasy. 
But, like, you still have to be consistent. Like, sorry, just this is a side issue. And I, I complained about this, how the, the white stabbed Jorah through his breastplate with, like, a dagger. And you're like, well, well Arjun, it's it's fantasy. It's, it's, you just have to accept it. I'm like, okay, if it was a Valerian steel dagger, I'm fine with that. Because that, that is magical. That is consistent with the end universe. If it was a Valerian steel dagger, if it was, like, the Night King just, like, punch through the guy because he's magical i'm fine with that that's that's okay to just like somehow go right through a, a metal breastplate keep in mind they have kind of higher late middle ages armor renaissance plate once it was built the um the blacksmiths would shoot it with a pistol and there'd be a dent in it and that would be proof against that would signify that it was bulletproof that's where the, the term comes from if i believe so and, and it just doesn't do anything. And so they have that. And then the army of the dead is 100,000. So they actually significantly outnumber the uh, the army of the dead. They probably outnumber them like 125 to 130,000 to 100,000. And like I said, uh, I ignoring the Dothraki, if, if you just if you put the Dothraki aside, they have maybe 15,000 people, most of them professional soldiers, be they knights or unsullied. They have armor, they have proper training, etc. Ten to one odds really aren't that bad if you have a big castle that you're defending. That's not really bad at all, especially if you have, like, decent soldiers. Like, the Army of the Dead, like, what they probably could have done is, keep in mind, there's a hundred thousand of them. If they had even a thousand archers, I mean, if they lose, like, 10 rounds of arrows, they could kill like a tenth of the enemy army. Obviously, they're not all going to hit. But from my understanding, if flaming arrows or uh, obsidian arrows hit them, they instantly like die and they can't be resurrected again. So they just had a bunch of arrows. They could have just slaughtered them. But they, they just decided that they weren't going to do that. So somehow they lost against enemies that don't have armor, that die in like one shot and can't defend themselves, despite having like all these guys, like the Dothraki Light Cavalry die in two minutes. Like, and no one like reacts to it at all. The Dothraki are, are technically like at parity with the whites and that they just suck. It's like, compare this, like I said, to Helm's Deep, where, where the good guys are defending, they're vastly outnumbered, but they use the fort to their advantage. They use the fort, they use proper strategy, and they lose, but they kill a disproportionately large number of guys. The rebels do that at the, um, the Battle of Endor. Another good example of this is the um, the Matrix Revolutions. Now, the movie's gar is pretty bad in general, but the, the defense of the dock scene is really good. Because it's really tense because you don't know what's going to happen. Because is humanity going to lose? Is the machines going to win? It's, it's not really easily predictable from the movie because you don't really know where the film's going at that point in time. And humanity just puts up the strongest possible fight. Literally everybody has guns. They have the mechs. They have the gun emplacements. And they're just firing like crazy. And they're losing, but they're killing so many machines at the same time that it's really up in the air who's going to win. Even though it's 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 hopeless, and it looks like their defeat is inevitable, there's still a lot of tension there. In this battle, like I said, it was decided in the first, like, five minutes of, of it. And then the rest of it was just a foregone conclusion until they could beat the Night King. Like, another good example of what I'm talking about is in Lord of the Rings... Sauron had basically given up on trying to get the ring back. He didn't think it was going to happen, so he had just basically resigned himself to winning the war through conventional military means. He had put massive orc armies together and was gradually just overrunning Gondor and the other men of the West Kingdoms, etc. So that's something I really like, is because Sauron was like, okay, I'm not going to just rely on a deus ex machina. I'm just going to try to win this war flat out. And I like that. And that is one of the reasons why Mass Effect 3 sucks and why people think Mass Effect 3 sucks. Because the previous two and a half games are about you build building a coalition. 
It's about everybody has to stand together to fight the Reapers. It's about getting everybody on board, getting all the fleets together, etc. But in the end, like once you get to Mass Effect 3, they're like, okay, we're not actually going to try to fight this war. We're just going to use a Deus Ex Machina to win. And the, the, the previous three games don't matter because we figured this random thing out. I'm like, th th then you shouldn't have had the previous three games build a coalition if the coalition is going to be completely pointless. And come to think of it, that's exactly what happens here. The coalition doesn't matter. Like, and Danny and John have dragons and the dragons are like MIA for most of the battle. Like you'd think if you have like a nuke and that's basically what a dragon is, you would just be strafing as much as possible. Like they can kill hundreds of whites in a single strafing run, but they, they just choose not to. So that like you have the good guys basically throw the battle through their own incompetence and just goofiness. It, it just detracts from it. And I didn't really have that big a problem with Arya killing the Night King. It, 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 that didn't really bother me. It was just kind of an anti-climax. They, they just, like... It's just all the build-up. They had a one-episode-long battle scene that wasn't very interesting and just didn't really pay off. Because, once again... If the good guys aren't even going to try, if they're not going to put up like a real effort. They're just resigned to die and to win by a by def by default. It doesn't add tension. It doesn't make it an interesting story. 